All right. Well, it's such a joy and a pleasure to be here with Jess and Susan, who will introduce themselves momentarily. Uh, my name is Steve Smith from Experiential Consulting, and I'm really thrilled and honored to be here with my uh, friends here today to share some interesting reflections on similar events and incidents that we have all had uh, in the great outdoors. Uh, so before I go any further, uh, I'll let my guests introduce themselves. Susan, would, would you mind getting us started? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, so my name is Susan Woodward. I live in Olympia, Washington. You can probably hear my Australian accent. That's where I grew up. Um, I love the outdoors. A huge reason why I live in the Pacific Northwest and really what attracted me here was just all of the incredible hiking opportunities here. So I am out amongst the mountains as frequently as I can be. And then in my professional life, I am a writer slash journalist communication strategist. And let's go to Jess. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Jess Nichols. I am a student uh, getting my master's in mechanical engineering right now at the University of Utah. Um, similarly, I've just been lucky enough to grow up in Utah where there's also a lot of outdoor activities and growing up just loving it and continue to be really grateful for, I don't know, where I get to live and what wonderful places we're surrounded by. Fantastic. Well, thanks again to both of you for being here with me today. And uh, we, our lives have all uh, intertwined in sort of, I would say, fairly hard to predict in, in interesting ways. And the it all goes back uh, to a story um, that I'll share from all the way back in 1998, which was an accident that I had uh, as a climber in the North Cascades here in my home state of Washington. Uh, and I don't want to dive deeply into the details of that incident because it has been thoroughly covered in, in some other settings. And I will leave you some links and, and notes about that uh, in the video notes. But just to summarize it for continuity and for the simplicity of our, our time here today, I was descending a snow slope at Asgard Pass up in the Enchantments, an area that has become quite popular, uh, very popular uh, in the 20 some years since my event happened. Um, but there was a uh, waterfall that was pouring over a small cliff band and, and running underneath the snowpack, uh, basically creating a luge course under the snowpack. And it was quite hidden and hard to detect uh, from above, either uh, visually or uh, listening. You could not really tell that it was there. And I was glissading or sliding down the snow, uh, following a partner who had gone ahead of me. And he was going so fast down the snow slope that he actually launched over this waterfall and landed safely on the other side. Uh, I was glissading much more carefully and slowly, uh, but not as carefully perhaps as I could have because I went over the lip and plopped right down uh, inside of the hole that was created where this waterfall poured underneath the snowpack. And I was trapped uh, in that hole. I, I fell about 30 feet. I had my pack on. I was wedged in tight in this pouring cold water um, uh, and became quite hypothermic. And it was kind of this com weird combination of soaking wet hypothermic and kind of drowning all at once. Uh, and really improbably, I would say, I somehow managed uh, after quite a struggle to not only extricate myself from where I was stuck, but then to tunnel out of the snow. And I, I popped out about 40 feet uh, away from where I had fallen in um, and flopped back out onto the snow, um, improbably like there in the sun. And my partner, I could see my partner up the hill screaming down into the hole that I had fallen into, trying to just see if I was still alive. And he was he was as startled as I was when uh, you know to 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 find myself alive from that experience. Um, it was quite traumatic. Uh, it was uh, very scary, you know, clearly my closest brush um, with death. And it, I think it was quite, you know, extraordinary that I that I fortunately survived. Um, 
But the, I think for me, the story kind of picks up some steam um, 20 years later or so when I was working at the Mountaineers here in Washington State. And my job was climbing education. And I had this large platform with their website and you know thousands of people that read their blogs and are members of the Mountaineers. And so I, um, I don't exactly know why, but I thought it would be a good time for me to share my story. Uh, and, and to I do know I do know why, which is I was trying to make a push at the Mountaineers at that point for people to share their lessons learned from their incidents and near misses and to not be ashamed of like what had happened to them and to try to promote learning from their experiences. And I thought, how can I ask them to do that? You know, if I don't do that myself, I could tell my Asgard past story. So as I was writing the story, uh, another young man went into the hole and died. And as I was reading about that and researching that, what I realized was that there have been four or five people that have gone into that same hole that I went into and uh, died. So it was really quite, um, you know, poignant for me uh, as my story was about ready to, to be published to see another, you know, event happen like that at Asgard Pass, re repeat events in exactly the same spot. Uh, and that that didn't feel good, but it did lead to when I did finally share my story, it got a tremendous amount of attention. And there were cable news folks contacting me and podcasts and the blog absolutely blew up uh, and was shared, you know, repeatedly around social media in lots of places. And so, uh, you know, while the event itself was traumatic and while it was quite sad that it was resonating with, you know, simultaneous news stories about yet another death at Asgard Pass, I did feel like there were some positive things that were coming from this, um, from, from sharing my story, including uh, working with the Forest Service and making a new, um, uh, very well done, I would say, sign uh, that they put up at the trailhead with an aerial photo showing Asgard Pass, showing where the hazard is, showing the terrain to avoid and terrain to um, consider using a, a, instead in the spring when, the, when it's covered in snow. And uh, I just felt like out of that traumatic event, lots of positive things ultimately eventually did come. And uh, that's where our guests today uh, come into the story. Uh, and um, it's my sincere hope that sharing, you know, my story has encouraged others to be humble and open and vulnerable and to do the same, and that we don't need to all make the same mistakes in order to benefit from, from learning from each other's experiences. So that brings me to my friend Susan, uh, who... Uh, Susan, please feel free to tell a little bit more about your yourself and your, you know, what you do and how our paths ended up crossing. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Um, wow. Your story <laughs> just um, makes my heart race, actually, hearing you tell it again and then um, bringing up what I, what I can share here is, uh, yeah, my heart's beating a little bit fast on that. I understand a little bit about how traumatic that must have been. My experience did not end up with me inside a snow hole like that, um, but very close to something like that happening. So, you know, I'm a hiker. I love to get out in the mountains, as I mentioned in the introduction. I, I just, I mean, I love it. It's just on, on every level. Um, I'm not that experienced in winter conditions. I mean, I do some skiing, downhill skiing and things like that, do a little bit of snowshoeing, but I'm not a, I'm not super experienced. I mean, I've, I've gone up Mount St. Helens up the winter route, um, which is, again, just like a long hike. So it's not a very technical kind of experience. I just want to start by just saying I'm, I'm not a mountaineer by any, by any means. Um, however, in April of 2021, I had the opportunity to go for some snowshoeing experience up near Mazama Ridge, or that was where we were headed to from Paradise um, at Mount Rainier. 
And the reason I was um, doing that was that I, I had a podcast at the time and I the podcast is all about all of the other species we share the planet with, the animal species that we share the planet with. And I was very interested in doing a podcast about the fact that Wolverine were coming back into Mount Rainier National Park for the first time in 100 years. And so I had reached out to the wildlife biologist who's with, uh, I think it's called Cascade Carnivores Project. I should probably look that up and make sure, but um, Jocelyn uh, Aitkins, her name is, to see if she would take me out on a field trip into some of this territory because she has all of these amazing wolverine stations in different places around Mount Rainier that allows them to capture DNA samples from fur and scat and that kind of thing um, so they can have some idea of how that population is doing. So I was really interested in doing a podcast about wolverine and Jocelyn agreed to, to take me out. So she was on... Uh, she was on skis and I was in snowshoes, which is my preferred means of getting around in snow. And we went out from paradise and um, ended up in a drainage area. Although at the time, I'm not sure that either one of us realized that we were really in this drainage area. So we were coming down um, a little bit of a ridge on the right hand side. There was a massive corner slip. And she was, you know, reminding me not to go anywhere near that. And then she kind of took off on her skis, went down a little bit of a hill and then stopped and waited for me. And she was a few hundred feet down the hill from me. And it was just this most beautiful, perfect day. I'm snapping photos, having a really beautiful time on the mountain and started to descend a little bit down towards her. And I remember actually having a little bit of an experience where I heard an inner voice say to me, this probably isn't the best route it might be better to veer off to the left and come down much more widely down this slope than to go straight straight down the way that I was headed but then my more rational brain said well she's she's gone down that way and she's waiting so this must be the way to go and I decided to pay a lot more attention I remember putting my phone away and then I took a few more steps and you know it was mid-morning beautiful spring day quite warm temperatures so the snow was starting to get really soft and I took a few more steps and I tripped. No big deal. I mean, so I tripped and I fell a little bit in my snowshoes. I didn't think anything much about it. And then I started to slide. And I still didn't think too much about it because I thought, well, I'm sitting on my butt, not even going particularly quickly. I'll wait until I stop and I'll stand up. Except that I didn't stop. I kept going. And I was picking up a little bit of speed. And then... I heard the sound of water. I just remember how it does not sound right. So I, I dug my snowshoes in and, and arrested and stopped. And then I looked and looked down and I could just see the lip of a, of a great big hole a few feet in front of me. And I, the way to describe it, I think, is that it was like a big toilet bowl and I was kind of on the edge of it. And it was this, it was just going to be this plummeting experience. And I just, I froze. And then I heard Jocelyn down the mountain say to me, you know, yelled up the mountain at me, don't move. She just shouted at me, don't move. And then next thing I knew in about three or four seconds, I'm not sure it took longer, she was standing there in front of me with her back towards the hole and just said, just turn around, stand up, turn around and walk out. I mean, if I had slipped, she was going to go down with me. So I did. I just literally stood up, grabbed my poles, grabbed my, you know, I still had my pack on, turned around and walked out of there. <clears throat> and it was only after we gathered ourselves and came back down and looked at the situation that we realized just how dangerous it was. So I have some pretty amazing photographs. There were actually two massive snow holes that were eroding into the snow of the mountain as it was melting from underneath. And I can imagine from the sound of the water, they probably were, you know, 30, 40 feet down to the Creek that runs through that drainage area. And, um, when I look back at the photos and see where I was, I was probably a foot to a foot and a half 
away from there being no return um, and falling into that hole. So that's what happened to me. It's like it's a near miss. I'm so grateful that I didn't fall in there. I can only imagine and I have imagined all of the horrific things that would have happened and could have happened and imagine they would have been similar to Steve's experience, although I, I don't see how I could have come out of that situation. Um, so I, anyway, I call that, that hole my death pit and I think about it. <laughs> and um, I, soon after that, uh, let, me, let me go back to how Steve and I met. So when I was reflecting on that day, a day or two later, I recalled that I had read your article, Steve, and I, I don't even remember how I found it. I had been online reading about, I, I mean, I, I'm a bit of an armchair mountaineer too, so I love to read <laughs> really cool things that people are doing out there that are much more courageous and doing much more adventurous things than, than I'm doing. So I came across your article and I had read it two or three weeks before going up to Mount Rainier and it was just largely completely coincidental However, it was the way that you had written and described the water falling down through that hole, that waterfall experience, that I think somehow when I was sliding down the mountain that day, when I heard water, I think somehow that triggered in me that this was a dangerous situation based on what I had read in your piece from your experience. So I reached out to Steve, sent him an email, really needed somebody to talk to about my near miss and uh, to thank him um, from the bottom of my heart because I do think that that well, I do think reading that may well have saved my life that day. In fact, I, I know that. So, yeah, hmm. that's the that's the short, long version. Sorry. <laughs> wow, Susan, thanks so much. And uh, it's quite emotional hearing you uh, describe that um, so, on lots of levels. And I just remember how moved I was uh, when you reached out um, and I told my wife, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this email I just got you know, from this person I don't even know, but it, it felt so, um, it felt so good knowing that you were okay, that you were alive and that, um, you know, my having shared my experience, uh, from 1998 somehow improbably brought, brought you and I together in what was that 2021 or 2021. Yeah. Um, yeah. So absolutely extraordinary. And, uh, I remember we had a series of just wonderful, you know, phone calls or Zoom calls like this. And um, um, you should mention the name of your podcast, by the way. Oh, my podcast. My podcast is called Sentient Planet. Great. Yes. And I think I, I helped you, um, you know, identify some guests for your podcast and stuff like that. So it just felt like such a meaningful um, connection with you. And um uh, it, I, I knew that, um, I knew that my having shared my blog, I, it had been read like 20,000 times within a few weeks. And, you know, I knew that it was getting a lot of, um, exposure to people, but honestly, Susan, you were the first person who directly, you know, shared with me, um, the connection between that blog post and your own like experience or your own yeah. near miss and wanting to just reach out and talk about your experience, uh, was, it's just so meaningful to me. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thanks, Steve. And I, I just love to add one little thing here that is pretty tragic. Um, a little bit like your experience. So, just a few weeks after my experience, there was a student from Seattle who was hiking in the same area and fell through a snow hole and, and perished up there. And if I remember correctly, in that case, uh, they actually did not locate um, that person, right? That person kind of disappeared forever. Yeah. Um, and I imagine if it was in the same area that I was in, I could, I could see why. Mm -hmm. very very deep into the mountain and it would probably be well into the spring or summer before somebody's body would potentially show up in a creek somewhere or maybe maybe washed much further down the mountain very sad to say but that's the that's the reality absolutely yes i remember that event so well and uh i think that i was thinking about that when you reached out that first time and i was wondering um if that was the same general area or 
you know, the, all that news was pretty fresh for me um, when when you first reached out to me. Yeah, it was the same general area. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, well, on that note, uh, similarly, uh, there were some real similarities, I think, actually, Jess, or Su Susan, I noticed between your story and, and my understanding of Jess's. So Jess, uh, I'd love to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about um, your experience. Yeah, very, very similar to Susan's story. Um, I was up on Mount Timpanogos, which is here in Utah, um, where I live. And um, it's it's not as big as Mount Rainier. People hike it in a big day um, in the summer, mostly. I was uh, training to climb Mount Rainier, and that was my friend and I, Tosh, were heading up and just doing a little overnighter to get some more practice on snow, um, sleeping on snow, walking on snow, crampons, ice axes, that kind of a thing. So it was springtime conditions being May. And um, yeah, we went, had a great time. It was wonderful. And uh, mountain Pinogus is a very stepped mountain. Um, that's just kind of the geography of it. And um, on our way down, I was in the lead. I've had a little bit more experience than Tosh has with that. And I got us off track. And um, kind of the rule of glissading is you don't, you glissade down what you've gone up. And so I got us off track without realizing it because some of the terrain finding is challenging there. And I was glissading down and we got into yeah, the chute that got pretty steep and I glissaded down and just saw this hole open up and was able to quickly self-arrest and yell to Tosh to stop and to not follow me down. And it was total like um, muscle reaction, muscle memory kind of a thing. I'm so grateful for all of that training that I had. Um, and similarly to what Susan said, I had recently listened to Steve's episode on the Sharpen podcast of Asgard Paps. So it was also in my brain. I was looking for it. And yet it's still almost happened. I just, I think I reflect on that a lot, how amazing it is that the conditions that we were lucky enough to have heard or read about it, and that was able to significantly, significantly alter the results of what happened to us. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many other people could potentially be here during this conversation that maybe we just haven't, you know, found out yet that maybe haven't been saved because they heard what you shared, Steve. And anyway, so I, yeah, I was able to self-arrest. Um, similarly, I have a picture of it. Um, I have no idea where the bottom is, no idea where it might pop out. Um, it does, it's not glacier, so it does melt out. I would have been found eventually, but um, definitely a freaky thing. And so, yeah, we were able to just you know, hike back up and hike out and it all ended up being just fine. Um, but that was definitely the closest near miss experience was on Temp than anything we had on Mount Rainier, which is, you know, a bigger mountain, which I also find just interesting how that can happen. We always need to be on our guard. So um, I, the way that I was able to get in contact with Steve was we I recorded a short story for the Sharp End podcast because she's doing these weekly short stories. Um, and I shared that story and talked about how I listened to Steve's episodes on the Sharp End podcast. And um, he was able to reach out to me and we've been able to connect because of that. And I'm so grateful to be able to like, thank you, Steve, and to be able to, um, I don't know, there's something about being able to bond over shared uh, shared trauma, <laughs> shared experiences, and um, to be able to learn from that. And as we've seen here, to be able to learn from so many people so that we can put into practice these things for ourselves. I, I obviously didn't know you, Jess, you know, leading up to that event, but I, you, you graciously agreed to just hop on a, a Zoom call with me a few weeks ago. And I remember just in those 
opening moments of the Zoom call, just this sense of joy, like we're both alive. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Just those opening moments of the call, it was just so joyful. (laughs) We're both here and talking to each other. It was amazing. Yes, yes. And and just how gracious you were in um, kind of describing, you know, how some of the lessons from those other podcasts had had affected, you know, your awareness of what does that sound that you're hearing? What does that mean? <laughs> um, let me just share an image here because I mentioned um, I mentioned the sign that I helped the Forest yeah. Service put together. Um, and I don't know if you all have seen this. Can you see that on your screen? Yeah. So this is the sign that the Forest Service um, worked with me and the um, uh, local mountain um, nonprofit in the Leavenworth area um, to put together. And uh, we, I helped with some of the specific text here Um, But you can see, like, if someone was standing at the top of Asgard Pass and just naturally started to let gravity take them, uh, I like to describe it as if you just dropped a tennis ball at the top of Asgard Pass and let that tennis ball go where it wanted to naturally go, the terrain uh, can funnel you pretty much right towards where that dangerous hazard is, where the waterfall forms. And that's why the waterfall forms there, right? Is because the, the the water naturally funnels down that drainage towards that spot. Um, a few weeks earlier, this would have been perfectly safe because it's covered in snow. And a few weeks later, perhaps it would be perfectly safe because there wouldn't be enough snow to glissade. Uh, and the, the, the waterfall might be more obvious, but there every spring, Um, there tends to be this little window of time and maybe that's a few weeks long or a month long where these conditions exist, where it's, you know, quite possible for someone to repeat that same mistake. And um, just looking at this image and listening to your two stories and thinking about what we were doing that day, um, you know, we didn't really know that we were in such a deadly hazardous place. And Susan, obviously you didn't either set out to have some kind of death defying adventure (laughs) that day while you were looking for Wolverine evidence, right? And and Jess, same with you. I don't think you were thinking of Mount Timp as sort of a extreme, you know, let's risk our lives for this uh, summit today, right? So I I think that's just an interesting thing to reflect on in terms of the um, understanding of what all three of us were signing up for and how benign conditions seemed to be compared to the suddenness um, of how, how quickly that can change. So I wonder if that resonates with you all or if you have things to say about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just... <laughs> oh I was just going to say if I wanted that experience, I'd go to a water park. <laughs> I think I'd <laughs> Yeah, no, it, this, I mean, I mentioned this earlier, but that Tim was supposed to be the chill, you know, fun, no big deal kind of a trip and was not supposed to include any sort of hazards. It's, you know, there's no crevasses. There's no, you know, you would think that it's just snow and snow, you know, sometimes it's slippery, but maybe that's the extent of the hazards and to all of a sudden find something like that that can eat you is is was pretty crazy. I was definitely not expecting that. Um it was surprising for sure. Yeah, me me too. I hear you Jess. So the day I was at as I described earlier, it was a perfect day, right? I mean blue sky, no wind, almost t-shirt weather in spring. Um it just, everything looked very doable. Everything, you know, we didn't see a lot. We didn't see avalanche activity. We didn't see anything looking particularly concerning. And again, I'm not that experienced, right? So I'm not sure what I'd be looking for necessarily anyway. However, my companion was very experienced and has been in this area and and this particular area dozens of times. Um, Been doing outdoor activity like this in mountains since she was eight years old. And she didn't catch it either. 
Yeah. Right. So when we and then it, you know it's really interesting. This is how unstable the conditions were that it just didn't appear that way. After that near death experience, when we were a little bit further down and looking back up at these massive gaping snow holes that you couldn't see until you had a different angle on it, that cornice I was telling you about that I, we noticed on the right on the way down, it it broke off right there a few hundred feet away from us mm. and it was we just stood there looking at each other like oh my god it, it and i started feeling like i'm just not supposed to be on this mountain mm -hmm. and it and you know jocelyn said to me that is the biggest cornice break i have ever seen in my entire life it was it, it, just incredible like you know apartment sized chunks of ice and snow falling down wild wild area so we probably shouldn't actually have been there in that drainage. I mean, when I think back about it, a much better route would have been up on Masma Ridge, heading up that way to get to the station and making our way down to it instead of down through the steep gully areas and going up, which were probably quite safe, relatively speaking, for somebody to ski through mm -hmm. really quickly. But for me on snowshoes, that was not the right equipment and really not the right time of year. So one of the things I've taken away from this is – um, I don't actually ever want to be in the Mount Rainier snowfields in spring ever again. It just mm. does not seem like the time of year that we're supposed to be out there. So maybe a little more dynamic and unstable and unpredictable than your risk tolerance calls for based on certainly, what, certainly what you're there me. to do, right? Certainly for me, Steve. And mm. I think also with climate change and mm -hmm. things being much more unpredictable. We'd had a really quite a significant uh, heat wave, or at least a, a much mm -hmm. uh, a much higher temperatures than usual just a few weeks before, and that's probably why, you know, the mountain was starting to open up the way that it was when we were there that day. So that just adds a whole other risk factor that yeah, I don't think I'm willing to take again. I think that is such a good point, and it also makes sense that. Of course, we want to get out in spring. It's starting to warm up. It is these beautiful days of t-shirt weather. Of course, you want to get out. And so I think it's an unfortunate combination of hazardous conditions that maybe not everybody knows about, um, especially if maybe they don't have the background of mountaineering and, you know, freeze thaw condition experience. And, you know, and so, but you still want to get out and hike. So these, these, the stars align in an unfortunate way a little bit with that yeah and on experience i think experience is a really interesting thing to ponder as well because the most experienced mountaineers in the world die all the time yeah. right so experience is not necessarily going to give you the information that you need I, and i really appreciate you bringing up climate change and in this regard, having a lot of experience in that particular valley, along with changing conditions and climate change, may mm -hmm. have been in some ways a disservice to your partner that day. She'd mm -hmm. probably been there dozens of times. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, having lots of experience in a particular place can blind us to the, the potential that it's different today. <laughs> today, there's something new or um, you know, climate change is something that may really be fundamentally changing glacier travel and areas that used to be relatively safe in April or May might, might not be that way anymore. Mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting to think that experience, of course, is helpful and is a good thing, but it can also at some point um, work against us if we're not mindful of how we that might create expectations that aren't consistent. Um, you know, you might be proceeding based on what it used to be like or what it should be like <laughs> instead yeah. of what it is today, right? Over-familiarization mm -hmm. is the term that I think of um, in that situation, yeah. And you let your guard down because you've been here so many times. I know this area. But yeah, like you said, it can be it can be changing. Wonderful comments. Any other kind of lessons learned for either of you about just snow travel, particularly, or like your experiences? Something you took away, you know, from that event? Yes, I have one. Um, I am so grateful that my partner was always behind me, um, so that there could be some reaction time um, with an earshot, but still some reaction time and that 
um, I was able to talk with her and, you know, help her stop in time. So I, anyway, I think that was really valuable and it's something that I definitely, um, I don't know, want to be mindful of that that helped. And mm. um, as well as having practice, you know, if you are using ice axes, um, you know, and that might be a little bit more specific on, you know, what kind of snow travel you're doing, but it does vary depending on if you're on skis or on snowshoes like Susan. And um, anyway, I think that all of those, there's so many factors. Yeah. Those are great lessons. Yeah. Good takeaways. When I, when I extricated myself from the snow hole uh, and I'll share in the notes here, like a link to the whole story and you can see some images of me on that day and stuff like that. Uh, when I extricated myself, I wanted to see what I had done wrong. And I assumed that I had made some careless error and I wanted to just identify it. You know, I wanted to identify the one thing that I, that I'd done wrong so that I could fix it. And I went back and I hiked safely hiked up above the snow hole for the second time. And I tried to see how close I could get to it in order to see when it would be detectable. Uh, and I was able to creep within just a few feet of the top of that waterfall and sitting in the snow because there was a con, it was kind of a concave or a convex roll before it dropped down into the, into this, into the, uh, the hole just a few feet away, I could not see the waterfall and I could not hear the waterfall. Uh, and it was a lot of water. It was, I mean, when you were in it, I mean, it was not a little trickle at all. It was a pouring waterfall, but I couldn't see it and I couldn't hear it just because of the, the acoustic nature of the snowpack and the terrain, it was completely invisible. And that was just mind boggling to me at the time, like what an incredibly deadly hazard uh, it was and how close I could get to it without any um, yeah. indication. And so the goal, the, 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 the takeaway ultimately, it, eventually my learning was don't glissade into terrain that you can't visually see, <laughs> you know, and you mentioned Jess, you, you, you very, you, I think you added to that by, you know, glissading known terrain. Right. And, and I would add that you can visually assess. <laughs> so I got to be pretty good at that point. Um, I didn't stop glissading. Um, I continued to glissade, but I, I got pretty good at standing glissading <laughs> so I could see better. And uh, I did not, um, I don't think I ever again glissaded into terrain like over, you know, bumps and over hills and things that I couldn't see the entire run out. So that was a, that was a pretty good specific takeaway for me. That's amazing. I, you either have to do that or you have to be going as fast as your friend and just clear it. <laughs> I'm so amazed. Like talking about risk and the person that's going slow is the one that falls in and the person that's cruising just clears it and that, how amazing that is as well. You know, and interestingly, you know, he was going, he was going pretty fast and he was able, he didn't, it wasn't his intention, you know, to leap over a <laughs> waterfall, but I was trying to keep up with him. You know, that was kind of my mindset was keep up and, you know, how did those dynamics contribute just to my not, um, recognizing the terrain I was glissading into and not stopping to, you know, scout better and all that kind of stuff. I was following my buddy's glissade track, you know, <laughs> um, and he had done it differently with a lot of momentum, <laughs> basically. <laughs> well, Steve, that's really interesting. So you and I have a, have a similar experience in that we were mm -hmm. somehow being influenced by the person who was ahead of us. Mm hmm and so one big takeaway for me that was really obvious was listen to my own instinct. So my own instinct did not want to take that route. And if I had gone the route the instinct was telling me to take, I would have skirted very widely around that dangerous area that I didn't know was there, right, but I would have done that. So huge lesson, I think, no matter how experienced the person is 
who we are out with, we also have to, we're also ultimately responsible for our, our own safety and our own lives. So that was a big one for me. Another big one for me was to really, really think through whatever equipment I'm bringing into the mountains. So I had this whole new level of appreciation. The following year, I was in the Goat Rocks area mm. doing some hiking and I did not bring micro spikes with me because I thought we're only going to get up to 6,000 feet. It's a very hot summer. We're not going to have to worry about any snow. Well, sure enough, we came across a north facing slope on our route that required us to go across it. And I didn't have my micro spikes and it was actually quite steep. There was a really very thin um, trail for us to go through, go across. It had not been well kicked in. And I had my crappy backpacking boots on, no spikes, just a couple of, of poles, and it really wasn't good enough. The equipment was not good enough for me to feel safe. Hmm. And had I slipped, had anybody slipped, there was a really nice frozen lake at the bottom there that would have been not a nice thing to fall into hmm. and no real way to stop yourself from rolling into that, with, especially with a heavy backpack on, right? So I got to the other side of that um, snowfield and had actually quite a PTSD experience on the other side because it just reminded me so much of how close I had come the previous year. And it was it was not a nice experience. I remember I just had to sit there for a while feeling quite traumatised. Mm. And that was all on me because I should have had my spikes and had I had them, it would have been no big deal. Just walk through, just walk across the snowfield. So actually, I went back there again this year, just two weeks ago, took my spikes with me, did the same route, and it was nothing, right? Walk straight across it. So equipment is super important. Really think through what you're taking, and you may not know exactly what all the conditions are going to be, but be prepared because what's an extra pound of micro spikes when um, you might need them? That's wonderful um, learning, Susan, and you're so sort of humble about, um, you know, building on your previous experience and letting that guide your future decision making. Uh, and uh, it's so cool that you got to go back to the same spot and do it <laughs> because you were, because you were prepared, right? And you, right. Had, you had some, um, you, you, you had a reason to be confident, you know, in that situation. Uh, it's interesting too. the other side of the coin, people's awareness, oh, I've got this GPS device, or I've got my I'm a backcountry skier and I have my um, airbag on me. So, you know, now I'm going to feel comfortable doing something that I wouldn't do without that tool, right? How does that potentially on the opposite side kind of influence us to do things that we might not otherwise do? <laughs> um, so there's, you know, there's always double edge. It's the relationship between your equipment and your decision making or the relationship between what your partner's doing and your decision making, you know, that is um, interesting stuff to kind of puzzle through. And, and I think, uh, I think you said just to be true to your own, how be true to yourself and how be tuned into what you are thinking and feeling, you know, in those situations. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't know if I'm necessarily thinking that I'll be more cautious when I'm out there, but much more aware, mm. much more aware of what I'm doing and, um, and, and just thinking just thinking things through more, just really kind of consciously sitting and thinking about the route I'm going to take and what equipment I'm going to need and just and then in the moment, you know, being really aware. I was snapping a lot of photos that day because it was so beautiful. And in that snapping of photos and walking around, I probably wasn't paying enough attention already, right? So just about to have this experience that I don't even know I'm going to have. But again, that inner voice saying to me, you know what, it's time to pay attention, put your phone away. And mm. I, I listened to that part. I just wish I had listened to the part about not taking that particular route between two hidden snow holes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting to imagine, you know, that all of our, we, we might not be on this Zoom call uh, if, if uh, you know, these events hadn't have gone down in the way that they did and we didn't have the ability to connect through blogs and podcasts and, you know, we're all connected here. And I, I think it's interesting that it took me 20 years to share my story. Um, and I have some guilt uh, about that. I, I, I wish I had shared it earlier. And there are, uh, you know, quite a few people who died in that hole. I'm really 
happy that in sharing it, um, you know, that it has had some positive outcomes for folks. But I'd be, I think it'd be useful to chat for a couple minutes about the things that make it easier and harder for people to share their stories. Um, when I uh, had my incident on Asgard Pass, I was a newly hired uh, outdoor educator and mountaineering instructor. And uh, that was an embarrassing thing that happened to me. And it was not something that I wanted to really openly talk about or process. And so it was quite easy to kind of tuck it away and, and not um, process it and not deal with the, um, the, the, the feelings from it and the self-doubt, you know, that an event like that um, could cause. And I don't think that's at all how I would suggest people respond <laughs> uh, when things like this happen. And I am so glad that eventually, you know, I, I did share the lessons learned from my experience and I processed that. Um, but even when I did, and even when I had like, you know, I'm a, a little bit more established in my career and a little more comfortable, you know, um, having, uh, you know, a platform and a position where I can, you know, share a story like that. I still got some, some pretty negative comments from people about, you know, having made those mistakes and, you know, people who didn't quite realize that the event had happened 20 years ago. Some people saying, well, that's a really well-known hazard. How could you not, how, <laughs> how, how could you, how could you possibly fall into the hole at Asgard Pass? You know, um, it's well or, known because of Steve. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or other people saying, you know, well, what a rookie mistake, you know, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I, I wonder if if you all have any thoughts, or maybe even Jess, did you have any anxiety, you know, sharing your event, you know, so so openly on the Sharp End podcast? And let's just talk a little bit about, um, you know, the things that might make it difficult for people to be forthcoming and share their lessons as good as we know that that uh, to be. Yeah. Um... I, I find that so interesting that people have said that too, Steve. And um, I, I think it's so important to establish a culture of being able to be open about the experiences we've had, because as evidenced by this meeting existing, they, they do save lives. And um, I feel very lucky that I've been surrounded by a pretty stellar culture as far as safety goes. And we are really big into debriefing after any sort of activity and saying what did we do well what maybe was where did we just get lucky um and i feel extremely grateful for that um i think that feels like um that's something that is promoted in some of the the guide services that i've been able to be a guide for a few different backpacking or um, rafting companies and to be able to have an environment and a culture where you talk about what went wrong, maybe where you messed up and it's respectful is so valuable. And I think Steve, you were so brave in sharing in such a large forum um, and having so many people that don't know you, they don't know your background. They don't know that you're, you know, making such a novice mistake or anything like that. Um, and what a cool thing that it is when you can have, a group of people that can help it be a little bit more positive. And hopefully we can continue to share that and spread that bit. We need to talk about these things for emotional recovery. We need to talk about them for learning for ourselves and for sharing with others. So others don't make those same mistakes. The only reason that hole in Asgard Pass is well known is because people have talked about it and been brave enough to share. Yeah, I think yeah. that I think the fear of ridicule is a real thing. Um, I think it stopped me from really sharing the story in the media that I have the opportunity to share it in. And I, I want to, um, I want to put it into, you know, my first person essay, I want to put it into my podcast, at least, um, to mention it, at least in the story that I still want to do about the Wolverine. 
because I did continue on that day um, and we did get up there to the Wolverine station and we did find some great DNA samples and there's a great story to tell there and I haven't completed it because there's no way to tell the story about that animal now without me winding in some of my personal experience from that day because I would be omitting something that is important and that really happened but I also don't want to make that podcast about that animal about me so I'm still considering what is the right balance there um, with all of that and the fear of ridicule right I think that um, in today's world we just see so much negativity and trolling and all of this other horrible stuff out there that does really horrible damage to people and a lot of bullying culture that kind of stuff so um, I have thought about that I'm not really up for that kind of ridicule right now maybe when I've processed this personally a little bit more um, I can put it out a little bit more in, in those media opportunities that I have. So, yeah, I thank you to Steve for going first on that. And, hey, man, whether it's 20 years or six months or whatever, you've, you've done that. And, look, it's made a, a huge difference to at least Jess and I, and I bet you there's many, many more people out there as well who have benefited from hearing about your experience. I mean, Jess and I had near misses. Yours, I would say, was I would couch it a little bit differently because you just, you came so close and, um, you know, I, I've, I've thought about what it would have been like for me to fall into that hole and to have a horrible drowning hypothermic death, which was a certainty had I done that. And so that's another lesson, right? That is not the kind of death I would like to have. But we don't get to necessarily choose, right? Um, but, you know, high adventure, high risk, all that kind of thing. So I haven't put it out. For that same fear of ridicule, I think, and it's such a personal thing. I want to kind of feel really good in myself again and have had had an opportunity to learn as many lessons in my own private thinking about it and sharing intimately with people like you who actually have had such similar experiences. You know what we're talking about. I think the folks that are out there ridiculing and talking about rookie mistakes and that kind of thing probably haven't had an experience like this yet. Not that I would ever wish that upon anybody, but it, that couldn't be coming from somebody who has had that kind of experience. I don't, I don't think so. It's easy to sit back and criticize um, from a position of, of of safety, right? So yeah, we need to. I, I agree with you, Jess. We need to. And Steve, thank you again for trying to shift that culture and helping us and many others, right, to talk about what can we learn because you shared your story. We somehow learned something from that. We did not have the same experience thanks to what you shared. And as Jess and I talk with other people and share our story as we can and see fit, who knows how that's going to help other people as well, right? We, it's, that's what it's all about. Well, you're, you're both way too kind and way too generous to me. Um, I, uh, I would say that these these ideas are, are not not my own. Um, you know, the one of my um, heroes in the risk management and safety world is a author and professor named Sidney Decker, and he has a wonderful short uh, expression that I think neatly applies to these situations, which is that you can either learn or you can blame, but you can't do both at the same time. Mm. And I think people are way too quick to judge and blame. And to identify as I was trying to do when I hiked back up above the waterfall, they want to look for the one thing, you know, that they can just fix and blame. And the idea behind all that online trolling and bashing is kind of like, well, it wouldn't happen to me, you know, and it's just not true. <laughs> you know, so I, I would hope that we can get better as a society and certainly as outdoor um, people um, at, at focusing on learning and not settling for the simple story where we blame someone but we look at the deeper story and we ask, and I love your question, Jess, at the end of your, of your adventures, you know, to ask today, were we lucky or were we good? Uh, if we were, if we were lucky, let's be honest about that. Right. Yeah. And if we did some things well, uh, let's talk about that too, because I think it's so easy just to be brief or focus on the tragic stories and focus on the things that have gone wrong. And I don't think we do enough at talking about the times where we've done things well, and we need to talk about that too, so we can do them again next time. <laughs> you know? 
Uh, and I, I want to give a lot of credit to Ashley Salpi at uh, The Sharp End, who has created such a remarkable series of podcasts that I think really do take the spirit of what we're talking about here, which is about learning and not shaming and blaming and throwing individuals under the bus, but really more about what how you know how can i see myself in the story that this person shared and how might i have how might i have made those same mistakes or how can i not make those same mistakes mm. um so i think there's a lot of really wonderful people that are starting to take this approach um and jess i'm curious like you're you've worked at some organizations and you seem to have some friends in a community that's already sort of embraced this this way of thinking about errors and incidents and near misses and i will say that's so refreshing and it just wasn't like that when i started in this field you know 30 some years ago and i'm curious just your thoughts on on like how did you find such a great group or what are the what are the things that allow you all to approach it that way or you know what advice would you have for folks who might be looking, you know, for that kind of a um, community to recreate with? Yeah, I mostly think I've gotten dang lucky <laughs> in finding some remarkable people. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for coming from a place of respect and realizing, just like Susan said earlier, bad things can happen to the experts that have done this their whole lives. And like you said, Steve, there is something that you can be learned that can be learned from every outdoor experience, the good and the bad. And um, so I, I think those are all aspects um, that are important parts of that culture. Um, I think as well, realizing that we need to learn and we if in order for me to feel safe traveling with people in the outdoors we need to be able to talk about these things um if people have egos unsafe egos you need a little right but having an unsafe ego um in the outdoors is scary and it's not necessarily something that i want to interact with and if there is that then i don't really want to go outside and do things with people like that. And so I think being a little selective about who I've had the privilege of going out and doing things with and um, where we try, try to have a little bit of a humble attitude towards mother nature and towards each other and towards just what is luck and the mountain will do what the mountain wants. Um, I think are all aspects of it. Um, I don't know if there's a specific formula, but those are things that we've at least tried to incorporate um, as well as like, say you're going and you're hiking and somebody feels uncomfortable. All it takes is one. No, Steve, you and I talked about that before, you know, all it, all it takes is one person and then no questions. Okay. We can be done. There's, you know, trying to not have um, summit fever or, you know, whatever the activity may be, it can be, so much more than just mountains that can be canyon, you know, desert, whatever it might be. Anyway, those are just a couple of thoughts as far as what I really, truly appreciated in my uh, friend group and in workplace as well. Susan, what would you, how would you respond or what would you add to that? Oh, I love what Jess is saying about being selective, actually about who you go into the great outdoors with. I think, you know, like-minded people who are respected and have some humility are definitely the folks that I go out backpacking with and they're, they're my people. Um, I, I have the same kind of aversion to a lot of ego. I also think it's it's pretty dangerous. Um, so I'm, I know I'm selective about who I go out with um, and it, it just it's a more enjoyable experience and there have been plenty of times I've been out there where somebody hasn't been comfortable or I haven't and we've turned around and come back or we've stopped for the night for folks to, to rest or whatever needs to happen, right? Adjusting adjusting um, a plan or a destination so that everybody can be comfortable, I think is, is really important as long as you're not doing that in a dangerous place, of course. Sometimes you do have to push on a little bit. But, yeah, um, I really I, I think that's right. Just think about who you're out there with and just being really aware 
yourself about what you're pushing for and why you are and um, is this really necessary, you know, um, and just if keeping each other keeping each other safe as much as possible. Well, I can't tell you uh, how much I've just enjoyed um, the chance for the three of us to be on the same call, for the three of us to be alive. <laughs> um, and uh, it would be so meaningful um, if we're ever all in the same place for the three of us to go on a hike, perhaps, um, because uh, you're my people. <laughs> and if we're going to be selective about who we uh, have adventures with, you know, it's <laughs> wonderful to, to, to imagine, um, you know, partners like the two of you. So... I hope maybe I don't know, Susan. Maybe you can take Jess and I to the to the lake uh, where where we can all bring our micro spikes. And uh... <laughs> oh, I would I would love to take you guys into the Goat Rocks wilderness for sure. It's just spectacular. Cool. Or, or or maybe a hike up to Kolchak Lake to look up at Asgard Pass sometime would be an interesting thing to. Uh, oh yeah. To do. Um, Let's do that. Let's so. do that. So open invitation, Jess, if you're coming to the Pacific Northwest, just give us a little advance notice and um, I'll clear my schedule and it'll be, see if we can get Susan to come along and have a little, okay. uh, a little debrief and adventure um, with the, with the three of us. But um, yeah. yeah, let's, let's, let's do that one. So um, yeah, I, I actually have hiked up Asgard Pass, but I prefer to do it in the summer, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's good. You know, it's good in all seasons. Uh, but just good, good to. There's some places you don't want to go. <laughs> uh, well, any kind of final words or thoughts or anything you'd like to say to the to the folks watching um, this video before we wrap things up? I just have a one thing that I think has come up a few times in in the discussion is some of these social heuristics that mm. lead us to maybe make some of the wrong decisions. Maybe Susan, I think with the friend that took you out, um, saying, well, she went down there, so it must be okay. You know, mm -hmm. I think kind of that expert halo that we could say, I think, you know, Steve, just like you wrote on um, the sign, you know, just because there's tracks there doesn't mean it's safe. You know, tracks is another one. I think that those classic heuristics are really valuable in, um, analyzing and helping us again with Susan's point of trusting your gut and analyzing the train and thinking about things critically while you're out there as well as some of the social implications of Steve feeling like he needs to hurry up to catch up with you know the bunny that you were going with anyway there's I, the, all of these pieces kept coming up and it's like man these so correspond with those heuristics that um, are just so applicable and are always a good review, I think. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, the group dynamics and kind of the social psychology of risk and, you know, how does your having a partner make you safer in some ways, but maybe less safe in others? And how do those group dynamics affect um, decision making? And, and fortunately, there has been a great deal of really well done studies and research and concepts like the expert halo and concepts like um you know the familiarity uh heuristic right. that susan mentioned and you know the the good news is that we i think the outdoor world is getting better and better at, at uh, not just knowing about that stuff but having names and common language and i know what it means you know when you refer to the expert halo and stuff like that so it's uh it's good that we're getting better at that. And I would suggest like weaving that into our after trip debriefs, you know, were we lucky or were we good? What heuristics may have helped us or hurt us today? Um, you know, heuristics are kind of like mental shortcuts and we do it all the time and they're not necessarily a bad thing, <laughs> um, but are we aware of them and are we on the same page with our partners and stuff like that? So I um, really appreciate you bringing that up. It's a great, um, for those of you watching this video who aren't as familiar with what Jess is talking about, there's a good reminder from Jess about <laughs> something really important to uh, to learn about, which is cognitive biases and uh, heuristics. Um, Susan, any kind of wrap up thoughts from you? Oh, just really simple ones. You know, do your homework, be prepared, listen to your instinct, and have fun. At the end of the day, it is. I mean, all of it is worth it. Um, to be out there and to reconnect 
to nature. Uh, I mean, we, we all have that yearning, I think, and um, fear of, uh, it's, it's okay to have some healthy fear, but that shouldn't stop people from getting out there and exploring and pushing their comfort zones at least a little bit. Wonderful final thoughts. And I'll just, my final thought is just how grateful I am to the two of you for spending part of your Sunday morning uh, and probably on a beautiful Sunday uh, in the Pacific Northwest and probably beautiful in uh, the yeah. Salt Lake area as well uh, <laughs> to take this time, um, you know, to help other people learn from our experiences um, just means a great deal. And Open invitation for a group hike, uh, maybe 2023. Let's see if we can make it happen. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the recording and thank everyone for watching um, Thanks, this Steve. conversation. Thanks.